so that everybody knows we're going to be recording the session. And if you haven't already, just want to welcome everybody again and please introduce yourself in the chat box. Share your name, your pronouns, your organization. Let us know where you're joining from just so that we get a better sense of who is here today. Uh, we've seen lots of um, introductions already in the chat. It is wonderful to see so many people joining from so many different parts of the US. So welcome everybody. And just a quick note about the chat, we will be using the chat feature mostly for today's webinar. And you can either select that you send your chat to just the panelists, that's just sending it to me and to my colleague, Sarah, or you can send it to all panelists and attendees if you want everybody to see your chat note. Okay, so please keep going, introducing yourself in the chat and we are gonna go ahead and get started. Um, before we get too far into the program, just wanna remind everybody on how to use Zoom in case this is your first time. I know some of us have spent the past year on Zoom but in case you're new to Zoom, just want to let you know that you are all automatically muted. We are in a Zoom webinar format, so no need to worry about background noise or barking dogs or anything like that. You're automatically muted. If you do want to join uh, in the conversation, and we encourage you to do that, please use the chat box to send a note to us or to all panelists and attendees, and we will try to take all of your questions throughout this webinar. And the last thing I want to mention is that we are recording the webinar today for future viewing, or if you want to share it with any colleagues or friends that didn't get to join today, I'll be sending that out to everybody by the end of the day tomorrow. Okay, so really quick introductions. I'm Ann Umali. I am the Director of Professional Development at the North American Association for Environmental Education, and I'm here with my colleague, Sarah. Sarah, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah Bodor, also with NAAEE, and I'm the Director of Policy and Affiliate Relations. Great to Thanks, be here Sarah. with you. Sarah and I are going to tag team our informational session today, and we're also co-leading this fellowship. So it's wonderful that um, we get a chance to speak to you directly, and you'll get a chance to ask us questions. We're the ones that are running this program. So hopefully we'll be the ones to, to be the best people to answer your questions. Okay, so in case you're not in the right place, just wanna let you know that we are all here to talk about the Sea Change Fellowship, which is a brand new fellowship that we are launching this year in 2021. And before I get too far into it, just wanna let you know of our overall agenda for the next hour. We are gonna talk a little bit about NAAEE, a quick overview of NAAEE and EE360, which is the program that supports this fellowship. And then we're gonna spend the bulk of the webinar today talking in the nitty gritty details of the fellowship, getting into all of the benefits, all the training opportunities and the networking opportunities, eligibility criteria to apply, and we'll also talk through the online application. I mentioned this before that we will be doing Q&A at the end, but also we wanna take your questions throughout our time today. And Sarah's gonna help me keep an eye on the chat. So anytime a question comes up, please type it in the chat and we will answer all of your questions um, while we're here together. Okay, what else? Anything else I missed Sarah on the agenda? Does everything look okay so far? Yeah, everything looks great. I just wanted to um, mention, uh, it was on your previous slide, that in addition to the EE360 program, the Cedar Tree Foundation is sponsoring this um, fellowship as well. So we're super grateful to Cedar Tree and to EPA. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Okay, so getting into our first agenda item, let's talk about NAAEE. And Sarah, I think you're gonna walk us through these next couple of slides. Yeah, thanks, Anne. Um, just a little bit about us in case you're unfamiliar with NAAEE. Um, we are, this is our vision. We are working towards a just and sustainable world uh, where environmental and social responsibility are driving our individual, institutional, and community choices. And um, you know, our mission statement is here. We're really about using the power of education to advance environmental literacy and civic engagement. So the two things that this fellowship um, is all about, or is what NAAEE is all about as well. And, 
And we do the, that to create a more equitable and sustainable future. And our work really spans formal and non-formal education. We work with educators, decision makers, um, and we just have a whole host of public and private partners throughout the world. Um, so we're basically the Professional Association for Environmental Education. I mentioned that we work with both formal and non-formal educators. We really um, work as a backbone organization for the field, um, and we work with educators across North America and, and actually have a global environmental education partnership as well, um, and working together to advance environmental literacy. Um, I've already kind of mentioned this, but we do have a super broad audience. Um, it's one of um, the power, part of the power of our network is that it really engages um, people working in all sectors. Um, and that's because environmental education really spans the boundaries of so many different sectors of government, higher education, early childhood, um, classroom, field-based, um, and so on. Um, and this slide um, shows um, our some of the logos of many of our affiliates. So we have state, regional, and provincial affiliate organizations um, across North America, and they together form what we call our affiliate network. Um, and they serve in similar roles um, at whatever scale they operate. So at the state level, if you're not engaged with your um, EE association, we would encourage you to check them out. Thanks, Sarah. So that was a super brief high level overview of our organization and AAEE. And now I just want to take the next couple of slides to talk briefly about EE360, which is a program within that's housed at NAAEE that supports this fellowship. I know we're, we're going into like many different levels of our organization, but stick with me here and we will we'll work through this together. So EE360, our overall vision for this program is an environmentally literate and engaged public that's building more resilient communities and working on more, a more sustainable future for all. So that's a huge vision for EE360. And we are trying to achieve that vision mainly through training and professional development. So we wanna train a cadre of di culturally diverse education professionals that are from the non-formal sector as well as the formal sector who have the knowledge and the skills and the tools needed to deliver high quality EE. And we are really focusing on delivering that training so that these efforts can be sustained over the long-term. So not just a one-shot deal. And You'll hear some of those um, overlaps between our vision and mission for NAAAE, EE360, and the Seed Change Fellowship Program. So this fellowship is just one way that we are trying to promote that training and professional development. And Sarah mentioned this earlier that we are being supported by Cedar Tree Foundation and EE360. One thing, one other thing I do wanna mention is that this is a brand new fellowship opportunity for us at NAAAE. We've had previous fellows in the past focused on climate change at the community level. For example, in 2018, we had a community EE fellowship program supported entirely by EE360. And this year, with the help of Cedar Tree Foundation, we're able to combine fellowship programs to do a more expansive view on, take a more expansive view on civics and environmental education. So something very new for us. And we really wanted to address the question of how we can bring these two different fields together, the two different fields of environmental education and civics education, knowing that each field has very specific goals and strategies for, for working in communities and for promoting environmental and uh, environmental action. And each group are, can be really good and have specific specific assets and how they really address community participation. So what we're trying to do is think about if folks in environmental ed can learn something from the civic education community in order to expand their networks and do their work better as environmental educators and vice versa, if civics educators can learn something from the EE community to expand their networks and expand their strategies and the work they do in civics education, why wouldn't we do something like that? And so this fellowship is our attempt to bring these two different fields together to learn and network and share with each other. 
Sarah, is there anything you wanted to add to that that I that I may have missed? I think that was a great overview. The only thing I would add is that for those of you who might have your background on the environmental education side of things, you probably know that um, particularly in a former formal classroom setting, the piece of the environmental education spectrum that often falls by the wayside is sort of the action project part of things. And so this fellowship and this kind of integration of civics education with environmental education um, provides us with a really great opportunity of recentering that action component that's so important to achieving the goals of environmental ed. That's perfect. Thank you, Sarah. So if we think about our fellowship in sort of like these four key buckets, this is how we could explain this fellowship. It's really divided into a giant focus on professional learning and professional development, on peer-to-peer -peer mentoring and networking, building leadership skills, and designing a community action project. So high level overview, if you wanted to put it in like one sentence, those are the four main areas of focus for this fellowship. And with professional learning and development, we are really trying to zero in on the specific skills that are needed to do community engagement and civic engagement well. And that includes building new skills in equity and inclusion, strategic communications, project planning, evaluation, and, and so much more. And you'll also see in this fellowship that we are trying to focus on peer-to-peer -peer mentoring and networking, recognizing that every single person coming into this fellowship program is going to bring a wealth of their own lifetime of experiences that they can share with others. People are gonna come in with all kinds of different skills. And so we really wanna promote that where each fellow has something to learn, but also each fellow has a lot of expertise to share with their fellow fellows. So we're going to really try to build in those strategies to, in, to enhance your, your networks and your mentoring opportunities with each other. And the note about leadership is that we understand that leadership truly involves very specific skills and qualities that can be taught, that can be learned. And so we really want to think about how, how are we addressing those leadership skills to help you be a better community leader. And this last piece on community on a community action project is that we really want to give fellows an opportunity to experiment with something new, with something innovative, with a brand new idea, or you can experiment you can experiment with a new strategy on how to engage a new audience, or something new that you're learning in this fellowship, in order to promote your community action project. So that's the fellowship in a nutshell. And I'm just gonna go um, a little bit deeper into the benefits. Um, before I get to that, I'm gonna try to see if I can, oh, there's one question I see from, from Robin here about a previous fellowship application when you applied in 2019. Wonderful question. And we're gonna get to that a little bit um, later on in the session today. So first digging into the benefits and this, is, this first one is one of my favorite ones to talk about. And this is all the professional development and leadership training that we offer. And right now there is a gigantic laundry list of topics that we have here. And there's just, there's so much that we wanna cover in this 18 month fellowship. Um, I'm particularly excited about the training we have planned around justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in the environmental movement. Um, we're going to be doing professional development on strategic communications, project planning, grant management, civic engagement, environmental education. And you'll see that some of these topics um, you may already know a lot about. Some of these topics may be new to you. And you'll see that some of these topics are just, I don't want to say just, but are, are kind of like basic project planning and project development, knowing that some of you might want some assistance on how to manage a grant, for example, or how do you, how do you manage a budget for a, a small community action project? So we're gonna really be focusing on those specific skills as well as skills related to civic engagement and environmental education. Another benefit of becoming a fellow is this enhanced network of fellows that will include leaders in civic education, environmental education, conservation, community resilience, and so much more. 
And you'll have that advanced network through mentoring and networking opportunities that we will provide for you within the fellows cohort, as well as the NAAAE network. And there are so many benefits also tied to face-to-face -face and virtual training. Just a couple of things I wanna mention is that we do have a virtual leadership institute planned for the second half of July this summer. That's going to be approximately two days or 16 hours worth of learning together. It's gonna to be spread out over the course of those two weeks. And those exact dates will depend on a needs assessment survey that we'll give to all of the accepted fellows. But if you could go ahead and block off that second half of July for that Leadership Institute, that'll really help us with the scheduling for that. Additionally, we'll plan monthly virtual webinars on priority topics that you identify as being priority topics for you. And lastly, we'll be providing scholarship funds for you to attend this year's annual virtual NAAAE conference and scholarship funds to attend a face-to-face -face follow up, hopefully face-to-face -face follow up, fingers crossed, in summer of 2022. I think this is the last slide of benefits. So many benefits to get through. I'm so excited to talk about them all. Um, this last slide talks about all of the different grants and mini grant funds that will be available to all the fellows. There will be opportunities to apply for a limited pool of mini grant funds to help you um, integrate your community action project with your fellowship. And, and these grants will range from $3,000 for a planning grant up to $10,000 for a collaboration grant. And a collaboration grant is defined by um, two or more fellows coming together to do a project and work on a project together. And we'll also have access, or you'll also have access to professional development funds. If you wanna seek out additional leadership training, if you wanna join a specific national conference to help you with your networking, or if you wanna um, reach out to a fellow fellow and do a learning exchange, and that can help provide, um, offset the costs for travel to meet each other to do a learning exchange. So I'm really excited about all the different ways that you can get professional development, not only um, the ones, the kinds of opportunities that we will design and provide for you, but you'll also have the flexibility to think about what opportunities are out there that you can find for your, for your own. Um, lastly, you'll, as an individual and as your organization, you'll get recognition through our, through our NAAAE and EE360 websites and networks. And the last benefit I wanna mention is that all fellows will have the opportunity to inform and participate in a brand new toolkit for educators that are working at this intersection of environmental ed and civic engagement and community engagement. So that's a brand new toolkit that we'll be designing in the next couple of years. I think that's the last of the benefits and that was kind of a mouthful. Are there any other benefits, Sarah, that, that you wanna um, mention or highlight that I didn't get a chance to talk about? No, I think that's a lot of benefits. <laughs> I think it's a lot of benefits too. And anything in the coming up in the chat that you think we should that we should talk about? I'm not seeing any questions. There's a shout out for the idea of a learning exchange though. Awesome. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. So going into the fellowship requirements. So yes, it's not all benefits, although there are a lot, we have a few requirements for the fellowship. And this is basically um, a participation requirement. It is 18 months long and you will be required to attend all the networking and training opportunities, attend our Virtual Leadership Institute, um, the 50th annual, annual NAAAE conference and also the in-person follow-up training next summer. You'll be required to design a community action project using some innovative civic engagement and EE strategy that you're learning throughout the fellowship. And you're also required to reach at least 100 people through your project. Additionally, we have some reporting and evaluation requirements and you'll be required to complete a plan for your project and complete a fundraising strategy plan for your project. 
but don't worry, we will be supporting you and helping you complete all of these requirements along the way. And, and we do have a couple questions coming in about the mini grants. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a question about, do the grant funds go to the fellow or to the fellows organization? In general, it will be 10 times easier for you if, you're, if the mini grant fund goes to your organization, basically for tax purposes. So that is also one reason why we ask you that it's a requirement to have a partner organization. You will all submit a partner letter of support as part of your online application. So that mini grant funds, the professional development funds, if you apply for them, that, that will go directly to your organization and your organization will give them to you to manage. I know there's some other like tax implications if the funds go to you as an individual and I'm not a tax advisor, but all I know is that it gets more complicated if you do it that way. I know we have done it that way in the past if, you, if that is not an option for you to work with an organization through their funding, but my recommendation is to have the funding go through that organization, your partner organization. And Anne, there's another question about the mini grants, um, about whether they can be used to support graduate thesis research. I, I would guess yes. I think that really depends on what, what the research project is. I would say yes without knowing too much more about it, but um, we have supported graduate research in the past when that research has been related to um, community engagement and working with new audiences through a university and it was part of your graduate research. So I would I would say as a not knowing too much about it that it's possible that the university could receive it. Um, typically universities have high percentages of overhead that they take out of those grant funds. So one way around that is to have another partner organization to help you accept the grant funds to do that. Um, those are all nitty gritty details though that we can that we can sort out later after you're accepted into the program. Any and, other questions, Sarah? Yeah, there's a great question here um, about the Community Action Project um, re reach requirement of 100 people. Um, let's see, Katie's asking, does the project have to be a one-time thing or could someone do one project two times in the 18 month span to reach that 100 person requirement like over two school years? Oh yeah, definitely, Katie. That is, that's a really good question. Um, we're not looking for one-time events where you're reaching 100 people in that one giant event, um, although that would be great too. But what we're really looking for is that reach over the lifetime of your project. And that's over that course of that 18 months. And to alleviate any worries that Katie and others may have, um, previous fellows where we've had this same requirement over the course of 18 months, every single fellow has been able to meet that 100 person requirement easily, like no problem. So we're, we're, we're counting all the folks that you reach if you do a teacher workshop, if you do an event, if you send out, um, if you do informational meetings and planning meetings to with your partner organization, that all counts towards people that you meet, um, but definitely does not have to be a one-time event. It can be spread out over the 18 months of your fellowship. That's a great question, Katie. Any other questions coming in, Sarah? Yes, let's see. Um, there's a question. Can this fellowship be carried out while overseas? That's, I think I would have to hear more about that. I think what we are trying to do is that the, the community action project takes place in North America. So that's Canada, US, Mexico, US territories. So as long as your community action project is taking place in North America, I think that's fine. If you're doing it remotely because you're working remotely for the next six months and you are based in, I don't know, uh, Cairo for the next six months and you're, you, you can do that, I think that's, I, I would guess yes, unless Judy, you wanna correct me if that's wrong, but I think the what, what we're gonna go off of is that the Community Action Project takes place in North America and that your partner organization is based in, in North America. But if you are physically overseas and you're able to do your work virtually because we're all working virtually right now, I think that's something that we could work out. Yeah. 
And Anne, I would just back you up that, um, yeah, I'll just say that, um, sorry, I'm just listening to all this great conversation. Um, hi, everybody. Um, to just say, we will work with you. Our goal is to get the best projects and the best work taking place and the best collaboration. So these are just great questions. And somebody also just asked, I think it was, um, let's see here, it was Alicia about projects including just students or they can they involve adults yeah. and again we will work with all of you and we would love to have some community projects focused on adults as well as thinking about k through 12 k through 12 and educators of k through 12 and non-formal so again we will work with all of you keep going Anne. But, but first judy we did not get a chance to introduce you and i am i am so sorry about about that but say say hello really quick and let folks know who you are. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. Sorry, Hi, man. everyone. Um, I'm just someone who lurks on webinars. Um, my name is Judy Browse, and I'm the executive director of the North American Association for Environmental Education, and just love this program and fellowship programs that actually build leadership in this opportunity to really link civic engagement, environmental education um, together, and to learn from each other. So really excited to be here. And just want to also thank again, I know you probably thanked up front Cedar Tree and Deborah, I see that you're on. And I wanted to give you the opportunity if you wanted to say anything. Um, um, and we can, and you can probably open it up, right? If Deborah would like to yeah. have a speaking role for a minute, and then we can keep going. Give me two seconds, um, Deborah, so that I can find that, find you on our list here. And but, then we'll um, get into the nitty gritty. <laughs> yes. Where are you? There you are. Okay. Deborah, I you can speak, Deborah, if you want to say hello. Sure. There can you, you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, Hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for for this uh coming to the webinar. And I'll just say I'm super excited on behalf of Cedar Tree to be partnering with Judy and her team and NAAAE on this fellowship and we just can't wait to see um, what the projects are and what folks end up doing with this. So uh, thanks for attending the webinar and I'm really looking forward to hopefully meeting some of you in, in either online in a Zoom box or in 2022 at the in-person meeting. Thank you, Deborah. And yes, it'll be Zoom for now and then in person next year, hopefully. Thank you for being here. Okay, let's take a few more questions if there are any more about the, the community action project. Let's see, I'm trying so to. No. We, we've got a couple more questions. There's a question about what happens if a fellow has to leave their organization. Yes, um, I see that question from Vanessa. Thanks for that question, Vanessa. I want to let you know that if this happens to you, you would not be the first person to do that. And we typically work with so many fellows in this cohort that are extremely upwardly mobile and taking promotions left and right. And so what we like to say is that we are really supporting the fellow as an individual in their professional learning and their careers. And if you take on a new position, hopefully that's a new position that's within the same field and we can work with you to, to really have a nice continuity in your community action project. That's typically what happens. And so, so yes, if that happens to you in this fellowship, we will continue to, to work with you. You will be a fellow for life. And we really want you to feel like you're involved in this network, no matter where you go in your, in your further future careers. Does that sound about right, Sarah? Yes. I love that. You're a fellow for life. <laughs> <laughs> yes, good or bad, you're a fellow for life. Um, I see there's also a question here from Laura asking about the time commitments for the Leadership Institute. I know lots of you, especially those who are teachers, might have some camps and other things going on in the summer, but the overall time commitment during that two-week period will be approximately 16 hours. So no more than that, and it will be spread out over the course of those two weeks. And um, we typically won't do any more than two hours, two to three hours max in one day. And what we will plan on doing is that once the fellowship class is selected, we'll do a survey and get everyone's schedules um, sorted out and only select times when people are available. 
So that's something that we're going to try to schedule um, as far in advance as possible and remain flexible. That's why we gave it that two week window so that we can figure out 16 hours that will that will hopefully overlap with everybody over the course of those two weeks. What else? Anything else? <laughs> Jude, yeah. I'm so scared to be about being a fellow for life. Yes, don't be scared. It's funny. There's a question about the partner organizations. Um, what kind of partner organizations are acceptable? Can it be academic and student focused or must it be environmentally focused? Great question. Really good question. And, and I, the answer to all those questions is yes. So yes, it can be an academic organization. It can be a school that you work with. It can be a higher ed institution, a K through 12 school. Um, it can be environmentally focused. All that we're asking is that you work with an organization that is making a positive contribution to the field of environmental education and civic education. So that is really broadly defined. I would suggest that you choose a partner, in, partner organization that you will be working very closely with in your community action project that knows you, that knows your work, and that's familiar with your with familiar with your skills, and that's really set up to support you in your in your fellowship. If you have specific questions about a specific partner organization, send me or Sarah an email, and we can we can hash out some of those details. Any other questions coming up, Sarah, that I missed? Um, yeah, just to follow up on that. Um, can the partner organization be my employer or should it be in addition to my employer? Oh, it, it definitely can be your employer. And just so you know, most of our fellows in the past use their, their employers as their partner organization. So that's, that's pretty typical. Um, it doesn't have to be your employer. It's, it's generally easier if, you're, if that's your work and your fellowship. So it's, it's really seamlessly integrated your work as a fellow and your day jobs, let's say. But if you do happen to find yourself working with an outside partner organization, that's totally okay too. And I see that Judy answered Catherine's question about how many fellows we anticipate selecting. We will be selecting up to 40 this year. So a really nice, nice group of 40 individuals. Okay, I think those are all the questions. I'm gonna move on to the online application, if that's okay. Since, since you all found this webinar, that means you found our website on NAAE, and that is the same exact place where you, where you will find our online application. The entire application will be completed online, and it is broken out into five general areas. The first section is just your personal information. Uh, the next section is more information about your professional and your leadership experience. You'll get an opportunity to explain that through a number of essay questions. You'll be uploading a resume. And then the bulk of your application will be devoted towards describing your community action project. And there's uh, guidelines there explaining that we want you to talk about the timeline, what audiences you intend to reach, your expected outcomes for your community action project, and so on. And, and just know that in this application, we're really asking for your ideas, your best ideas and your best thinking on a community action project. This doesn't have to be something that you've already um, successfully achieved in the past or that you're, it doesn't even have to be a current project. It can be a current and ongoing project, um, but you'll have to explain you know, what new twist or new direction or new audience you'd hope to take it in by participating in this fellowship. But bottom line is it's okay and we want you to be really creative and innovative and thinking big about your community action project. And the last thing about the community action project I wanna mention is that it is absolutely okay to make changes to your project throughout the lifetime of your fellowship. So don't think about this application as being a contract uh, for what you plan to do in your fellowship, we actually want you to make changes and make, make your project ideas better and enhance your project based on what you're learning and based on the contacts that you're making during the fellowship. So just keep that in mind that 
there will be many, many opportunities to improve upon the ideas that you submit in the application process. And let's see, number four on this list is you're required to submit two letters. One will be from a, your professional reference and the other is from your partner organization. And then the last section of the online application is a section where you get to describe what specific professional development opportunities are you personally looking for that would benefit you in your work. And you get a chance to also write a little bit about what specific skills and special areas of expertise would you be personally bringing to this cohort? You know, going back to that peer to peer model that I mentioned earlier, what experiences can you contribute um, to this cohort? Let's see, anything else folks want to mention or that Sarah, Judy want to mention about the online application? Okay, nope. and Judy did mention in the chat that we do want you to be working through an adaptive management process that really encourages you to take many, many opportunities to evaluate your work and make changes along the way. And I do see that there's a question from Evan about whether or not we think these will be more mostly new ideas or ideas in progress. Honestly, I, I'm not sure what to anticipate <laughs> for this, but I think I, 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 all I would say is that we welcome both. We welcome brand new ideas that you want to experiment with. We welcome ongoing and current projects. But the only thing I would say is that if you are presenting an ongoing project, we really do want you to be thoughtful in how this fellowship will help you take your project to a to a new place, whether that's a new audience or a new strategy that you're hoping to learn in this fellowship. Okay, I'm just waiting to see if there's any more questions coming in the chat. Okay. Just want to give, give you a short screenshot of what it looks like. If you go to our website, if you scroll about halfway down the page, you'll see a button very close to where you registered for the webinar that says start your application. And that will take you directly to the online application. It will automatically get saved. I think it's every 30 seconds, it's, it's automatically saved. So you don't have to fill it out all at the same time. You can fill it, fill it out over a number of days and go back to it when you, you know, have fresh eyes again um, for your application. Okay, so a quick note about folks that may have applied for the 2020 EE360 fellowship program. And 2020 was such a crazy year, as we all know, we did postpone the community engagement or the EE360 community EE fellowship program. However, if you applied for that and you want to apply for this program, we are so welcome, welcoming of that. So please do apply. I would recommend that you update your application to include all of the new experiences and training opportunities or any learning that occurred over the past year so that your application will be more competitive. And if you take a look at our current online application, you should recognize many of the questions. Many of the questions are very similar to the 2019 application. And so it shouldn't take too much for you to, to just tweak your application slightly to include all the new learning you had last year. Additionally, if you're gonna be planning on using the same partner organization, we'll take your partner letter from your old application and you don't have to submit a new uh, professional reference. We will take your professional reference from, from last year as well. And Let's see, I see Laura has a question if letters can come from individuals from the same organization. That's totally fine. I think if you wanna submit a, a partner letter from your partner organization that, and that's coming from the executive director, perfect. And then a professional reference that really knows you, your leadership ability, your skills working with communities, your civic engagement skills, and that's a different person within the same organization, that's totally fine too. All I, all I suggest is that 
you select someone that's really familiar with all of your professional accomplishments. So, and if it's from the same organization, that is totally fine. Okay, let's see, there's a few more questions coming in. And there's another follow-up question from Laura asking if that partner letter should be tied to your community action project. That's an easy, that's an easy yes. So your partner organization is the organization that you will work um, the most with to implement your community action project. So absolutely should be tied to your community action project and they should be really specific about how they're going to support you as a fellow and to support your work in, in your project and how they're going to continuously help you with your professional development. So yes, your partner organization should be in directly involved with your community action project. And let's see, any other questions? Okay, Catherine is asking, if the executive director is the person who knows us best, can they also sign the partner letter or does it need to be a different person? Um, hmm. <laughs> what do you think, Sarah? I, I recommend that you would have a more well-rounded application if it's two different people. So if it is if it is your partner organization that and it's the ED that knows you the best, have them do your partner letter of support. But try to find somebody else within the organization, whether that's a board member or a colleague. It doesn't have to be somebody that supervises you, but someone that is just familiar with your, your professional work, your leadership skills. Definitely better to have two different perspectives for your partner letter and for your professional reference. Sarah, did I miss any other questions? So there, there is a question about um, whether there are any um, demographic guidelines or preferences um, with regard to who is reached by the Community Action Project. That's a great question. Um, I would, I mean, quick answer is that we don't have a short list of priority audiences. What we are really interested in seeing in your application is that you're really thoughtful in who you are hoping to reach and what capacities you have within yourself and within your organization to reach those intended audiences. Um, so for example, if I am you know, working in, I live in Northern Virginia, if my plan is to work with you know, uh, Ecuadorian nationals that are living in Arlington County, which is where I live, or Bolivians, like how, how, am I, how is my partner organization set up to, to work with that particular audience? What connections do I already have? And what is the rationale and the need for working with that particular audience? Um, bonus points, if you are working with audiences that are traditionally underserved or that have not had an opportunity, have had many opportunities to work in a community action project, around the environment or civic engagement. Um, and Judy, I see that you just put yourself on camera. So I know you wanna add something. What do you wanna add, Judy? <laughs> hey, and uh, I hope I'm not driving you crazy. No, no you're not, um, please, please chime in. No, I just wanted to mention that we are trying to balance the formal and non-formal educators that um, will be part of this fellowship so we can learn from each other. So we are hoping that we will have a clump of fellows that are working in kind of the K through 12 arena. That doesn't mean it has to be um, in a classroom. It can just be working, you know, with the formal school system in some way. And then we also want to um, have a group that's working in non-formal education. And again, kids, um, adult learners, it can be a mix. We are trying to really share lessons learned, have mentoring going on, and seeing how we can think about you know, civic engagement and environmental education in an inclusive and collaborative way. That's great. Thank you for saying that, Judy. And I do want to add that as we're putting the cohort together, our ideal is that we will have 40 individuals that are representing a broad, broad spectrum of all the different audiences that could be reached uh, schools, like Judy mentioned, formal and non-formal, different demographics. Um, I would say don't feel that you personally have to reach this, 
this broad spectrum of audiences and urban and rural in your own specific project, but as a collective group, we want the, the cohort to represent um, reaching different audiences and using lots of different strategies. And the, with the idea that if we have a cohort working with different audiences, using all kinds of different strategies, we'll be able to have a lot more sharing and mentoring going on with, and learning in the group. So that's, that's our goal of putting that cohort together. But um, other, other than that, I, wouldn't, I would say choose an audience that you are familiar with, that you have a lot of experience with, and maybe in your, in your project, think about some way you want to possibly update your work to reach a new audience uh, with, a new, with a new strategy. Let's see. OK, there, I see there's a question about um, if this fellowship will be offered in 2023. And I would say that hopefully, Alexandria, if all the stars align, we will be able to offer this fellowship opportunity again. We are not able to say what we're doing just yet, but that's our ultimate goal is to be able to offer this fellowship again in 2023. And I see there's also a question from Katie about seeing previous fellows and projects. And yes, if you go to our website, you'll see uh, profiles and descriptions of community action projects from our last cohort of fellows from 2018, I think is the last time we did a fellowship program. Okay, just waiting to see if there's any other questions. Sarah, did I miss anything? I don't think so. I'm looking for the link to the profiles of the previous fellows. And if I can find it, I'll drop it in the chat because um, I think it is a little bit hard to find on our website. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. Okay. Let's see. There's a long question here from Laura that I'll need to read through <laughs> before I can answer it. Um, I say if you if you have specific questions about letters of support, partner letters, please send me an email. The email is here on, on the screen right now. And we will work it out and figure out the best letter of support that's going to best represent your leadership skills, your qualifications, and also demonstrate your ability to work with or your ability to support um, this community action project. Okay, there's a question here from Evan. Do you expect prior projects to be similar to applications to this year, especially in terms of scope and ambition? Um, I expect the projects to be grander and bolder and bigger this year, but that's just, that's just me and my own expectations. But Evan, it's hard to say, but honestly, Evan, I am continuously pleasantly surprised by the creativity and the ideas that come through whenever we do these application processes. So I don't know if that my expectations are low or that just the, the applicant pool is always so wonderful, but I encourage you to really be thinking creatively and thinking big about you know new ideas because this is a really wonderful opportunity to experiment and play with an idea and try something new. And we aren't so much concerned about, you know, the, the, the product you develop or the, the you know, long-term outcome. Although we are concerned about that, I think we're mostly concerned about how do we share the learning and the growing that is happening. If you change your mind, if you do an entire 180 on an audience or a project or a strategy idea, that's totally okay. But we want to know why you did that so that we get a better sense of where does that, where is that learning happening and what are the criteria people are using to change their minds or to expand their thinking. So don't be shy about presenting a bold and big idea. Okay, any other questions? Oh, I see. Okay, so there's a follow-up question from Evan, like how might um, these current applications differ from past fellows projects. I would say for this one, since there is a, a brand new 
integration with the civic engagement field, I expect more of the projects to be really focused on how, you know, and combining with the environmental movement, like how are we building active citizens and how are we talking about community engagement and active citizenship in order to promote a, an environmental outcome. So I'm really thinking we'll see a lot more integration in these project ideas. Um, I would say that if you, if you don't have a lot of those ideas yet in the beginning of your application, that's okay. And there's, there's space to improve upon that throughout the course of your fellowship. But I also think we might be seeing more, this is just, just a guess, I think we might be seeing more about expanding into new audiences and looking into focusing on underserved audiences, audiences that have not had an opportunity to, to really engage with the civic engagement or the EE fields. Um, I'm thinking that we'll see a lot more projects focusing on the justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion issues that come up in this space, just because that's that's what we're seeing from our partners right now, more of that conversation around justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And so I wouldn't be surprised if a majority of our, our applicants are talking about reaching new audiences in creative ways and what are the partnerships that need to be built and formed in order to do that well. Okay, any other final questions? This is your last chance to ask us a question or any other final comments from you, Sarah or Judy or Deborah about anything we talked about today? And great job, seriously. <laughs> Such a great job answering questions. The only thing I would say is that this is an education program. And so we're talking about civic engagement, but we are also thinking about that in terms of what are the skills and abilities to get there, not actually taking a specific action to move forward. So we are really on the education side of helping people understand what it means to be civically engaged. And so thrilled all of you could be on it. And, and Sarah and Deborah and Anne, great job. Thanks, Judy. Sarah, anything you want to add? Final thoughts? No, I'm just really excited um, for when the applications start coming in to see the, the creative and innovative ideas out there. Me too. And please reach out to us as you are working on your applications. We are here to support you. And as you know, we always focus on professional development and learning, and that starts from the very early stages from your application process. So if you have questions and want some feedback on anything at all, please, please reach out. All right, well, that is all we've got. Ooh, actually, before we go away, <laughs> I have one more, one more invitation. For those of you who haven't yet joined EE Pro, join it. It is a wonderful location opportunity to connect to other environmental education professionals about so many different things. There are special interest groups. There are places to look for jobs, to look for other webinar opportunities and training opportunities. It is free to join. And as you're working on your application and thinking about other ways to connect to the NAAAA network, this is a wonderful place to get started if you're not there already. So that is my last request for, for all of you as you work on your applications. And that is it. Thanks again, everybody, for joining us and look forward to getting your application soon. March 17th is the deadline, so you've got lots of time. And we'll see you, see you later. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Judy. Thanks, Anne. Bye, everybody.